Indie Beacon Radio with host B. Allen Bourgeois. Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Indie Beacon Show. This is your host, B. Allen Bourgeois, and I have with me Herb Sennett. Welcome, Herb. Hi there. <laughs> so um, you have a rich history. Um, and I guess that kind of comes with age. We, we do a lot of things over time and stuff. Um, but your history, your, all the things you have done, have kind of brought you to this point of being a writer. So I'd like to go ahead and touch upon some of those things. Um, you were an educator. You worked in um, as minister, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, You've done theater, you've done productions, you've done a lot of things. So, uh, my, wife, my wife has constantly wondered uh, whether she was really married or not. <laughs> Never saw me around the house much. But I, I, I just had a, a lot of interest and most of them I knew I would not be able to pursue so I narrowed in on the few that I felt I had a real talent for. And so I ended up literally with two careers. Uh, one as a college professor, and secondly as an army reserve chaplain. So it, uh, I ran those together and had a lot of fun with it. I taught for almost uh, 15, no, 20 years. Uh, involving theatrical arts. I taught theater, I taught theater history, I taught acting, directing, all of these kinds of things in college. Produced numerous productions through college as well as uh, semi-professional theater. I never really pursued a career in the theater itself. Uh, then I, I found this side of me that my faith is very strong. Uh, I was raised in the church. And so I, I felt this calling to do something. I spent six years as a pastor, but that really was not what I was uh, searching for. That's not what I wanted to do. And when the opportunity arose for me to go back into the army as a reservist and as a chaplain, I jumped on it. And that was where I really felt at home. Spent 21 years doing that. Okay, so I've got to ask, um, you weren't a spring chicken when you went into the reserve. So what age were you when you, you would do that? Well, now you have to stop and remember, uh, I graduated from college in 1968. And I went through, RO I signed up for ROTC so that I would not get drafted out. That was a bit of a problem. I had a low number. I did not want to go to Vietnam as a private. I said, if I got to go, I'd rather go over as an officer. Get pay is more. My wife would get big, better benefits. And so I chose to do that. And so I spent six years in the Army Reserves, um, and on two years on active duty. I spent a year in combat in Vietnam. And when I got home, I continued that, but I resigned my commission after my uh, required time was up. And then I went back in, although I was 30 some odd, I don't remember exactly, but I was, I was uh, pretty close to 30 uh, when I went, uh, 32 or so when I went back in. So I wasn't really uh, that young, I mean that old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it. Thirty? It's got no. It's got to be close. <laughs> What's my thirty-eight? <laughs> I think when I went back in, but I kept in. Uh, I kept in good shape. I uh, took care of myself. I was still strong. I could still run the two miles that's required. A physical aspect, past the physical with uh, with glowing numbers. So there was uh, no real issue involved. It, it, my philosophy has always been take care of my faith, take care of my uh, emotional health, take care of my intellectual health, take care of my family. And with those things, I, I, I was able to do a whole lot. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very satisfied. When I retired, 
I was ready to walk away from teaching. I was ready to walk away. <laughs> I did not long to be back into the classroom. And so I turned around, I wrote, written three novels. Uh, I did write two books toward the end of my career having to do with theater. Uh, but I related both of them to uh, to my faith, my Christian faith, and uh, and they sold pretty well. One of them is a standard uh, in uh, both theatrical as well, well as dramatic literature, uh, and is in just about every uh, English-speaking library in the world. So you know, I, I've accomplished a few things without becoming quote famous. <laughs> Never had to deal with all of that. Uh, however, that might have that might be about ready to end uh, because at 75 years of age, I have uh, taken the inspiration of Donald Trump and uh, Mr. Biden uh, at their age and saying, well, why can't I? So I'm running for the Florida House of Representatives. <laughs> Good. Um, we'll talk more Mike about that in a moment. Um, I, yeah, that's congratulations because even at my age, 60, you know, I kind of wanted, you know, it's something I've always wanted to participate in was a political life and stuff, but I've always pushed it back. But nonetheless, um, you, you were at 65 when you started writing novels. And you yeah. have three of them done. Um, they are the, excuse me, the Reluctant General, yes. Death of Duval Street, and Death on A1A. So right off the bat, I want to ask, which one was your more enjoyable one to write? Because they're all different in, in some respects. Very definitely. I had so much fun writing all three. And I, but I, but I think I'm done with the mystery novels. Uh, I've turned back to the reluctant general genre, which is historical fiction, sort of, yeah, but sort of fiction because it's based uh, almost exclusively on the biblical story of Barack and Deborah, uh, which takes place somewhere around the period of 1250 years before Christ. So it's a very ancient, and I've done a great deal of study, both from a military standpoint as far as, and also a cultural standpoint. Um, in fact, I got, a, got some criticism uh, on the, the reluctant general. I had Deborah uh, praying to God and uh, talking to him uh, as if he were uh, a neighbor or whatever. Uh, referring to him as Lord, etc. A, a Jewish rabbi wrote me back and said, a, a, a Jewish person would never, ever refer directly to God. And I wrote back and I said, this was 1,200 years before the birth of Christ. <laughs> They had just come from Egypt. <laughs> they had no clue how to talk to God, and they talked to him any way they wanted to, because all the tradition you're talking about came about, about during that next five or six hundred years. <laughs> so it just, I, I had to correct him on his history. He wrote back and he said, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before you write anything down, make sure your T's are crossed <laughs> and your I's are dotted and you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, because you definitely did a lot of um, research on that and, and it was difficult in its own way because you're talking about 3,200 years ago. So there wasn't a whole lot of written history that you could use. Um, and so that must have been a big challenge for you. It was fun in that I had to research the military side of it. And already having had a, a fairly strong military background, I've been to several of the military schools, uh, and so I had some understanding of how the military mindset works. And I made the assumption, okay, the details are different, the concepts, have always been the same. 
how can I win this battle with the equipment and the people that I have? And so I put my head together with that, studied a lot of the uh, tactics of the military during that particular time. And I think I came up with a uh, plausible explanation of how those 10,000 farmers could have easily overcome a trained military of 50,000 uh, soldiers. And I don't know, I was trying to breathe as much truth, I think, as I could into the biblical account, because that's what the Bible says happened. <laughs> And that's all Being a challenge. minister, I wasn't about to try to lie about it. <laughs> well, this is a point where we do need to step away, let our sponsors do their thing, but we'll be right back. I'm Rox Berkey. And I'm Charles Brakefield. We're award-winning co-authors, Brakefield and Berkey, of the Enigma book series. There are 10 books in these series, with book number 11 planned for release in January 2020. Each story has a central technology focus ranging from identity theft to cryptocurrency and now AI wars. These adult techno thrillers pit cyber good guys against cyber thugs across the dark net. In our world, technology is today's weapon of choice. You can enjoy ebook format, paper, or audible. We want your feedback. Until the next story, thank you. Thanks. Well, hello there, my friends. My name is Randy James, independent voiceover producer in the Dallas, Texas area, available to write and record a 30-second commercial, much like the one you're hearing right now. It's a great way to help increase awareness and exposure to your book title. It's easy to do. Simply call me, and we'll brainstorm on a few ideas, and in a few hours, I'll whip something up and send you a digital file ready to use. Remember, call or text me, Randy James, at 214-762-1900. Four, two. Welcome to IndieLector.store, an online bookstore where the discriminating reader can find award-winning books. IndieLector.store is not a big corporation, so it can give up to 80% of the sales directly to the author. Help us support them by buying a great book at IndieLector.store. Hello, I am the author and poet Denise Bryson. I am the author of The Things That Cross My Mind, Love's Reality, both in book and audio form. I am also noted as one of the best poets of 2011. I have two new projects coming up. One is the Blinky series, where Blinky tells us all about our coins and our bills for our children. I also have a book coming out called Say Ye. It's quotes from Denise Bryson, just inspirational and that will help you along the way. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back. This is your host, Beyond Bourgeois, and I have Herb Senna with me. Um, we were talking about, in the last episode, um, what got him into the writing career and all of his past history, and the book that he wrote, The Reluctant General. Now we're going to talk about Death on Duval Street, because that sounds like a murder mystery right off the bat. So, oh boy, is it ever. Tell and us. Okay, here's the problem. I had this wonderful idea for a story, but I kept wondering, how can I write this story as a Christian minister? Because it revolves around a gay, retired New York detective and his gay lover and the death of not necessarily a gay person but a uh, uh, a cross-dressing performer a male a male uh, performing females on stage so female impersonator and I said now how can I do this and not uh, really upset all of my good friends. The story, I think, it, it is quite strong. The only criticism I've gotten of the story was uh, there was a little bit too much Christianity in it, and I got to thinking less than 5% of the total writing of almost uh, 60,000 words had anything to do with it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so <laughs> any mention would have been too much for some people. I just let that roll off my back and don't worry about it. One person said, well, your writing would seem to make Duval Street seem to be so clean and pure and not the, uh, the what the reality of it is. And I said, well, I'm writing for a general audience. I'm not writing for people who are looking for the really nasty side of things. And I, and I let that roll off too, because I'm proud of the story. Uh, it, it's, it holds together. It's strong. Uh, sadly, I think in a couple of places I let slip so that people were guessing who the murderer was early on. But I fixed that in the next novel. <laughs> so your um, chief of detective, um, Perry, um, how did he get, I mean, how did that character come up? I mean, let's face it, I mean, a, a gay retired police officer from New York is a bit out of your normal um, chain of, of friendships in, in some respects. So how did you create that? And what is amazing to me is uh, one of my roommates in college was gay. And I learned a lot about uh, that whole lifestyle and everything, and especially since uh, he came out to me and I don't think he ever told anybody else. Uh, one of my wife's best friends was a lady that she had grown up with was her sweet mate. She was gay and she came out to her friends and this is back in the 60s. So it was this was this was hard for them because they were they were facing some serious issues. And uh, I've always been a person that has tried to be um, very open and very um, accepting of a person just as they are. I don't try to make people uh, what I want them to be. I want people to be themselves. I may disagree theologically with what they're doing and how they act, but I don't see that person as being that. They are who they are. I'm their friend, and I want to do that. Um, and so it, it was out of that early relationship. And over the years, I've known, new, well, hello, I spent almost 20 years in theater. <laughs> That's, I, I was either going to either get along with them or not. And I was the most unusual person uh, anybody in the theater had ever had to deal with because I accepted anyone just as they are. And, and that has also helped me with uh, moving from a Christian college that I taught at over into a state college where I spent the last 15 years of my career and accepting everybody just as they are. And I found it quite easily to do that. And, and I had people from all walks of life, from everything you could possibly think of. Uh, and the college I taught at was predominantly, uh, <laughs> predominantly white, black, and Hispanic. <laughs> it's like, I think it was divided in thirds. There was none of them <laughs> it was predominantly anything. And, and I found out that, and I knew all along, people are just people. Kids are just kids. Students are just students. There's the, the color and all of that kind of stuff and their culture has nothing to do with their desire to become more educated, to become a better person than they are. And I respected that. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you, the character Perry Savant ended up in your second book, which was Death on A1A. So um, this in itself is a little interesting story because it's um, there in Florida, but on a road that you really wouldn't expect. So I'm going to let you explain that. <laughs> A1A is the, the most famous road in Florida. Everybody who's lived here or visited knows where A1A is. And it's that highway that runs right directly along the ocean on the east side. Uh, I had an opportunity couple of years ago to drive down the coastal highway in California. 
and found a lot of similarities, except down close to LA, you didn't have the massive high rises that you have on A1A down by Miami and, and Fort Lauderdale, which uh, they, they protected the uh, ocean view in California a lot better than we did down here in, my, in Florida. However, that road is, uh, is considered one of the busiest uh, roads, especially down in Fort Lauderdale, Miami. An incident happened in Palm Beach along A1A where a, a, unfortunately a homeless guy happened to be over there. He was run over by accident and killed. And the man who, who actually was driving the car n never felt, he, he felt a bump, but he thought he hit the curb along the way there and didn't realize he had actually run over. So when the news came out the next morning, he turned himself into the police department. He says, I may have been the one, I don't know. Uh, it was a really a sad story and everything, but that got the wheels up here turning. And I created this, character of Perry Savant. And so I have him, we, we discover why he left New York and moved to, to Key West at the beginning of that book. And then it traveled, he comes down, he runs into a friend of his from NYPD who moved to Miami before he re fully retired. And they get together because homeless men are being murdered along A1A. <laughs> and, and everybody's got, the, they don't have any idea who in the world it, it could have been. And I had a lot of fun with that, a lot of fun with it. And, and I enjoy the writing. So anyway, I, I love writing. I love being a part, creating dramatic structures. And that, I guess that's in my blood, <laughs> theater blood. <laughs> So we only have just about a minute left. Um, this, as you mentioned earlier, this is probably the end of your fictional stories, your murder mystery types. Um, and you wanted to get back into historical fiction, but you're running for office. So how are you managing that? <laughs> Very carefully, that's <laughs> the best I can say. I don't know, I have a lot of time. I, I budget my time. And so I spend, uh, place it out and I get things done and I try to accomplish what I need to accomplish. Uh, of course, I'm running in a district where uh, statistics say I have almost no chance of winning. So I told my wife, look, I promise you this, if I win the election, I'll demand a recount. How is that? So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I really want to go to Tallahassee <laughs> six months out of each year. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thankfully, it's only six months and, and not full time. So um, we are at that point. We need to take a break and let our sponsors do their thing. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching or listening to Indie Beacon Radio. Our sponsor, IndieLector.Store, is the only bookstore that pays authors their fair share for book sales. Help authors to succeed and enjoy a great book by supporting them at IndieLector.Store. Enjoy a 10% discount with coupon code SHOPPER20 at IndieLector.Store. Coupon valid until December 31st, 2020. That's IndieLector.Store, coupon code SHOPPER20. The fifth annual Authors Marketing Event. Two days of live seminars in marketing for authors. The only organization that certifies authors in marketing. Live and free to the first 100 authors registered. Sponsored by Bubblish, empowering authorpreneurs. And Indie Lector Store, paying authors for their fair share. Head to www.2020.authorsmarketingguild.com today. 
What started as a love letter to her son has become an international love letter for all parents to their children. Now you can read acclaimed author Shanna Lee Charbonneau's story to your children. When her son was very sick, she calmed him by singing her own song to him. She turned that song into the book, My Mama Loves Me, I'm Her Little Boy. She wrote three more magical books for all parents and kids six and under. Available at Indie Lecter, Amazon, and all local and national outlets. Authors Marketing Guild is a membership-owned organization designed to help authors succeed and learn how to better market and sell themselves and their books. Join us at AuthorsMarketingGuild.com and receive so many benefits you'll wonder why you didn't join sooner. That's AuthorsMarketingGuild.com. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back. This is your host, B. Alan Bourgeois, and I'm with Herb Sennett on Indie Beacon Show. We've been talking about his books. His last one was Death on A1A. He had Death of Duval Street before that, and his first book, The Reluctant General. So where can people find these books um, and, and reach out to you? Pretty, pretty much anywhere. Um, I, they, my, my website is novelsbyherb.com. And on there, they can order from just about, it, it, if you just hit buy now, it'll take you to a page where you can select from what vendor or, you know, where if you want it from Amazon or you want it from any of the others, it, they're all, they're available um, as in pretty much any form that you want. Okay. Now, granted, we're in the COVID situation there in Florida as well as elsewhere. There's a lot of cases going on. So a lot of book festival events have been canceled. Mm -hmm. But um, on your website, do you list what events you're hoping to do, whether it be virtual or um, in person? Well, for the next uh, six months, I'll be dealing mostly with um, the the election painting <laughs> politics, <laughs> but uh, I will be at the Florida Writers Con Conference in October. Uh, this year it will be virtual, but I'm a part of that. I'm also the executive vice president for the Florida Writers Association here. Uh, it's a an organization that I absolutely love. I, I, I enjoy being a part of it and giving a shout out to um, our the, the people that do a tremendous job. Uh, and I don't care what they come up with next year. We're doing our conference face to face. <laughs> <laughs> this virtual thing just uh, isn't quite my bag. <laughs> I fully understand that. We've had to adjust ourselves. And I have been to the Florida event a couple of years ago. So. It, it was a fun event to be at and stuff. I was um, probably there. <laughs> so once you see, hopefully um, the election's over, win or lose, um, those six months of the year that you know you're going to have off, what's the next book you're going to be working on? Actually, I've already started my next book, and it's called Gideon's Gamble. And it's the story of Gideon. Uh, sadly, most people who are familiar with Bible stories only know about the 300 that he used. Uh, however, that story is a lot more complicated than that little thing where they come running out of the woods with lights on and blowing trumpets and everything. It's far more complicated. It's a much longer story, and even Gideon himself uh, struggles with uh, what he's having to do. and. So I'm, uh, this one will be less of a military adventure and more of uh, trying to get inside the head of a man who is trying his best to save the world uh, that he was born into in the culture. And that, that's why it's taking me a little, a bit, little bit longer. So, and by the way, uh, the Florida legislature only meets from six to seven weeks a year. Weeks, not months. Oh, weeks, not months. <laughs> well, in Texas, we meet every other year, and it's about three months. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, 
I'm sure you've got some other story ideas in the back of your brain, don't you? Oh, uh, I got one for Perry, and it's uh, he's going to be dealing with a, a a bunch of drug lords that are sneaking in um, um, through with using uh, small boats uh, from. Uh, from basically Cuba and a couple of other places uh, in South Mexico and so forth, coming across and then coming into the Keys. And it's, uh, I haven't worked out everything just yet, but that's an idea I came up with. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to go into too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, actually a perfect place to stop because we are at the end of the show. Thank I want to you. thank you very much, Irv, for being with us, and we do wish you the best of luck. Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website. Indie Beacon Radio with the host, B. Allen Bourgeois. Indie Beacon Radio is produced by B. Allen Bourgeois for authors Mark and Guild, LLC, copyright 2020. Voice over by Randy James, Lydia Bello, and B. Allen Bourgeois. To be a sponsor of the show or for more information, please email us at info at authorsmarketingguild.com. To be interviewed for the show, please complete the form at radio.authorsmarketingguild.com. Music Always Rejoice by Ram Corp.